All right, we are recording. Great. Okay, welcome everybody. So today we're going to be talking about type systems. Oh, first, um, first let me let me just share the results of the poll. So it looks like people are doing okay, but um, definitely feels like more of you have. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see the results. Hmm. I clicked end. Uh, hopefully it's hopefully it's sharing the results of the poll with you. Yeah, Lance, I see. Um, I clicked end poll and it's not uh, it's not sharing. But in general, yeah, it does feel like people's stress is going up. And um, I'm sorry to hear that. And I hope that uh, as usual, please let me know if there's anything I can do. Please let me know if you need someone to talk to or if there's anything I can do to help. Truly, I'm here here to help out and um, would would welcome the chance to just talk and listen if uh, if that's helpful. So please reach out if uh, if you need to. Okay, um, so I don't know, we'll just leave that poll window there and maybe at some point later, it'll somehow magically show up for all of you. Okay, so let's take a quick look at our schedule and uh, I'll share my desktop here. So here we are on Friday, April 3rd. We're gonna be talking about type systems today. And um, we're going to, sorry, I'm just, there we go. we're talking about type systems today. And um, uh, this is in preparation to give you what you need for your final lab. So lazy programming is due on Monday. Remember, I don't, would uh, love it if you didn't work on that at all during conference weekend. So it's due on Monday. And then your final, 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 um, uh, project is due on Wednesday, April 15th. That's the last day of class. That's our type checker. And um, just so that just so that we get a sense of that lab, I want to take you really quickly over to um, the lab the lab spec. It's because I think it'd be helpful as we go through today's lecture for you to have seen the lab spec in case you haven't looked at it yet. Just so you know where we're headed with all of this. So the idea of your final lab is that we want you to build a type checker. So we're actually gonna go back to Racket and, um, and Julia. So this is the last thing that you'll do. We're gonna give you an interpreter called the CI Types Interpreter. So this is just a Julia-based interpreter. And the idea is that we want you to type check the program. And to do this, you're gonna to have to be doing, making some type judgments. And so we're gonna talk a lot, a lot about typing today sort of, and, uh, and then again on Monday to lay the foundation for this. But the idea is we're gonna change, um, we're gonna change just a little bit the way that our grammar works. So we're gonna let people annotate functions with, um, with a type. So the, specifically the input type. And then, so for example, you might have a function like this, lambda x and um, and takes a, this new colon and a, a type. And so hopefully, uh, sorry, so we're gonna take the, so we're gonna change our grammar. Um, we've given you like the parser and basic calculator, but we want you to add a step in the analysis, which goes ahead and checks to make sure that everything, um, everything, the types of everything match up. Okay, so you're gonna implement this specific function called type of expression. And uh, so you don't have to evaluate the code. We're not running the code. This is done at analysis time. So it's after lexing and parsing, but before calculation. We're doing it at analysis time, you're just checking to make sure the types of everything are gonna match up. And you're gonna have to do it recursively. So, um, okay, so that's where we're headed. We'll, we'll go more in depth into the lab spec at a later time. But I just wanted you to see that just so that we're just so that we're clear about where we're headed. All right, so today and Monday, we're talking about type systems and then just a few lectures on these miscellaneous um, ideas and languages that I wanted to cover as part of the class. Um, before we dive into today's slide deck, is there any questions? Are there any questions on the lazy programming lab? If you've got a question, raise your hand or just gently unmute yourself. Okay, if not, then let's go ahead and switch over to types. Okay, um, 
So today we're talking about types. And we've talked about types a little bit throughout the course of this. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold, on, hold on. Before we even get there, very important thing that I almost forgot to tell you about, conference challenge. Um, so conference challenge, this is something I do with all of my classes. And um, so I'm going to do it with you guys. And it's going to be a little bit different this year because of the pandemic. But, uh, but this is super fun. So here's, here's what we do. So every year, every class, uh, you know, our classes overlap with conference. And so I like to do this conference challenge with my students. Uh, it's just a fun chance for us to think about conference and to um, kind of share some of our insights and things about conference. But the way that it works is we pick a single session of conference, um, whereby we, I mean I. So I pick a session of conference and I'm gonna pick the Sunday morning session. Okay, so everybody listen, Sunday morning session. And I am gonna take notes on the Sunday morning session and they're gonna be really good notes. And then on Monday, I'm going to ask you like ridiculously unfairly hard questions about, about that session of conference. So for example, in previous conference challenges, the questions have been things like, the third speaker wore a striped tie. Did the stripes go from left to right or from right to left? And um, the second person I think got that one answer right. Um, <laughs> other questions, um, one of my favorites was what was the sixth word spoken in conference and just with a little bit of thought you can actually probably guess what it was. Um, another couple, of, there's just a couple of possibilities for the sixth word. Other possibilities, and then I'll ask you some more serious questions as well like uh, who spoke about hobbits and why or who talked about search engine optimization and why. So and then I'll also love to hear your thoughts from conference. So, Ordinarily, I, I would also um, combine the conference challenge with large amounts of candy, which I would throw out into the room. It's um, tremendous fun. And unfortunately, um, that particular part of the conference challenge isn't gonna happen. So I may, what I may do is like have some candy bars in my office. And when this is all blown over, people can come to my office and maybe grab something. We'll see. So, um, so the conference challenge is you take really good notes. I take really good notes. I ask you ridiculously hard questions. You try to answer them. And maybe if you want, you can try to ask me ridiculously hard questions and we'll see how I do. Okay, that's conference challenge. Um, look forward to uh, talking about it on Monday. So Sunday morning session though, that's when we're, that's where we're focusing on, okay? Of course you should focus on all of conference. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, so today, Stand by. What happened? There we go. So today we're talking about types, and we're going to start with a little discussion about why type systems are incomplete and how they help us, even though they are incomplete. We're going to talk about pros and cons of types and what advantages they bring to us as programmers and when they're useful and when they're not. Then we're going to spend a bunch of time today talking about a comparison of different languages. So we're going to look at a bunch of different languages and how each language thinks about types. And we're going to do that by comparing them along several different axes. So we're going to think about static versus dynamic types and the languages that employ them. We're going to think about strong versus weak, explicit versus implicit, and nominal versus structural. And we've used those terms kind of ad hocly through, ad hocly, I don't know, is that a word? It is now, ad hocly throughout the course of the semester. But today we're really going to try to put some precision to what exactly we mean. And you'll see that uh, these different axes of comparison are by and large orthogonal to each other. So we'll see examples of languages that just about cover every combination of these four axes. And then if we have time today, which we probably won't, but if we do, we'll start thinking a little bit about type judgments and type systems. Okay, so let's dive in. How do we catch bugs in programs? And um, you know, there's a lot of ways we can think about catching bugs. Um, so clearly, there's things like syntax bugs, and like our parser catches syntax bugs. So things like this, like here's a little, here actually, let me bring out my laser pointer. Um, here's a little, like, here's a little, a little program, um, and it's just missing some parts. And so at the parser will throw some sort of error here and it'll tell us, hey, that was not correct. So this, Syntactic bugs are super easy to, 
to find um, usually, although sometimes those missing semicolons can really confuse the parser. Uh, but in general, syntactic bugs are pretty easy. Um, there are simple semantic bugs that we can find. So for example, here's a little expression where we've got, for example, an unbound variable. And we could probably do a little bit of analysis of a program and find something, uh, maybe uncover some bugs of this sort. Um, but then there are type errors. And this can either happen at compile time or runtime. And types can help us. They're one way that they can help us write better code, code that is more error free. And the reason for that is types describe a certain invariant that must always hold true across any run of a program. So we'll talk about that um, in a minute. Uh, but here's the question. So use your little participant window. And um, actually, no, 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 better, 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 better. Let's see. Um, uh, okay, sorry, um, but looks like polling is totally broken right now. Oh, this is so frustrating. Mm. All right. I'm going to, so sorry, um, I'll just end that. Let me try a different poll. Oh, I can't. Yeah, okay, polling is totally broken. I can't run any polls. Okay, so this is gonna be a little less interactive than I had hoped. Ah, that's so frustrating. You know, let me try closing it. I don't know, maybe it'll come back a little later. So what I was hoping was that, um, um, what I was hoping was that um, I would be able to run a little poll and you guys could all answer, um, answer this. Um, okay, but Eric, looks like you've got your hand up. What's up? We could try using the yes, no buttons that are. On. Yeah, okay, let's, well, yeah, I mean, we could, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't like count as far as I know. Oh, maybe it does. Okay, can everybody, so just really, this is an experiment. I've never actually tried to do this. Do types solve all of our problems? Yes or no? So go ahead and um, vote yes or no. Oh yeah, it is working and it's counting. And what I mean by solving all our problems is if I write a program where all of the types are correct for all the expressions and everything's properly labeled, is that a perfect bug-free program? That's what I mean, because it solves all of our problems. All right, um, of the 24 of you that are here, it looks like 17 of you said no, and one of you said yes. Awesome. Yeah, clearly, like types don't solve all of our problems. We've all written buggy programs in typed languages. So why is that? Like, types seem awesome. Why is it that types don't protect us? And um, here's an example of a simple program that is essentially impossible to analyze um, I and mean, we've talked about this before. So imagine that we have some fairly simple little program, but like it's hard to analyze. And the reasons why it's hard to analyze, you know, a very simple way to make it hard to analyze is to stick something like a collats function right in the middle. So is this program correct? Can we analyze this program and can we tell if it's correct or not? And the answer is, well, sort of, I mean, but not really. In order to know, so, so let's just make sure we understand what's going on here. So we've got plus three, and then we've got this if expression. And if the if expression returns, like if collats returns true, in other words, if this halts, we'll go ahead and return five, and then that'll be okay. But if it, but um, actually, let's, so let's suppose, um, uh, yeah, okay, I should probably change this example just a little bit. I apologize. Let's suppose that what we want to know is, does collats return in an even number of steps, okay? So instead of, um, instead of collats 42, let's imagine, you know, if it's even, then we'll return five, but if it's odd, then we'll return a function. So we'll return a closure. Is this program correct? And the answer is, well, clearly, it might be correct if, Collats returned in, in an even number of iterations, but it might not be if it was odd, if it was an odd number of iterations. How can we tell? We say, well, look, this isn't a non deterministic program. This is perfectly deterministic. The collats function is deterministic, but it's unanalyzable. And, and this is a surrogate for more complex programs that are unanalyzable. So even if something maybe would be correct, it's often difficult because of things like the halting problem to analyze programs, even with strong type systems. So you can't necessarily collect, catch all bugs 
even in the presence of strong, of strong type systems. And as a result, um, because type systems are always prey to the halting problem, uh, you sort of have one of two choices. You can either over or under approximate. So either you have to reject programs that might have run without an error, or you have to accept programs that will crash when run. And so quick, I'm gonna do a quick vote here. Let's say yes is one and no is two. Which would you rather do? Which, if you're gonna build a language and a type system, so yes is one, no is two, which way are you, which way are you gonna go? Are you going to build a language that rejects programs that might have run or accept programs that will crash when run? Okay, um, looks like the results are in and all of you have voted. Um, well, actually the votes are fluctuating a little bit. Hold on, let me wait till they settle down here. Um, okay, 15 to three. So 15 of you said you must accept programs that will crash. Um, when run. And that's, yeah, that's, that's what most people decide. So most people who build languages decide, even if we put a really strong type system in, even if we do our best, you can still write buggy programs. And we would rather give a programmer more rope and they can hang themselves with it, um, rather than be presumptuous and reject programs that the programmer knows are correct but we, because we're a dumb compiler, don't know they're correct, and so we reject them and won't run them. The programmer knows that they would have been fine. So we never want, we never want to um, err on that side of things. All right, so let's, um, so with that sort of background, so type systems are awesome, type systems help, but they're not a panacea, they don't somehow magically bulletproof our program. So what is a type? We've talked about this before, and I just want to remind ourselves of the formal, of the formal definition in this class of a type, so it's a set of values, and then a set of legal operations on those values. So remember that we've talked about, um, we've talked about sort of basic types or elemental types. Uh, so we've integers or strings or booleans, things like that. And we've got a set of values. So it could be infinite, and as well as a set of operations. So strings, you can do things like concatenate and split. Numbers, you can do things like add and subtract and multiply. Booleans, you can do things like Boolean algebra, sorts of operations. And those, and remember that the set of legal operations is independent of whatever syntax we use to describe those operations. So for example, the plus syntactic, the plus operator syntactically is often overloaded in a lot of languages. And, means different things depending on different contexts and blah, 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 blah. But for the purposes of thinking about types, forget about the syntax and just think more abstractly about what a type is. And so we can think about types in, especially languages like Haskell, which are super strongly typed, as a property of a program that we can always establish without even running it. And so what we mean by that is um, in statically typed languages, statically strongly typed languages, we can actually look at the program and we can assign at every point in the program a specific type to the results of an expression. And, and we can do that. And because we can do that without even running it, it must hold for every possible run of the program. So no matter what the input variables are, that's going to be a provably um, consistent and constant property of the program. So which is kind of cool. It's very powerful, but um, as we said, not a panacea. Okay, so. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment here. Um, I did this for the first time in my other class on, I mean my grad class, on, um, on Wednesday. So Zoom has this kind of cool feature where we can create breakout rooms. And you guys know, like during class, I have to ask you to turn to your neighbors and discuss something. And so what I'm going to do is we're just going to take five minutes. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to create some breakout rooms. I think I'm gonna create three breakout rooms. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna create these breakout rooms and you guys are all gonna get farmed out automatically into one of these three breakout rooms. So it'll be about eight of you per room. And what I'd like you to do is just talk to each other for a few minutes. Um, 
about the pros and cons of types, okay? So, and then we're gonna come back and I want you all to tell me what you talked about. So we're gonna try to our best to do some of the peer instruction that we loved doing back in, um, back when we were all meeting together. Okay, so is it clear? So I'm gonna create breakout rooms. I'm gonna click the button. You're all gonna get sort of farmed out magically into these breakout rooms. we will just be with a couple of other people. Go ahead and unmute yourselves and then talk about why types are good and maybe why types are bad. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss it, okay? And uh, let me, so, hold on. Oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to create breakout rooms here. We're gonna create three rooms and you're all assigned now. So I'm gonna open the rooms and you should all get kicked out of this main room. You'll get kicked into the breakout rooms and then in five minutes, I'll, I'll magically bring you all back in. Okay, here we go. All right, hopefully, hopefully everyone is coming back now.
All right, everyone's coming back. We'll wait just a second here for everyone to filter back in. All right, I think everyone is back. So um, by the way, I think I finally got the results of the poll up. So uh, just so you guys can see that. So I think polling is back to working, yay. Um, so quick question, uh, since we've never done that before, um, I'd just like to know, quickly vote yes or no. Did you like it? Like, did that work? Was it effective? Was that fun? Um, did you feel like that was a useful thing? Like, should we do more of that? No, I, I know yes and no is a little bit binary, but if you could each just weigh in really quickly, that'd be super helpful for me to know, just so that we're clear on, um, like for the future, if that's something that we wanna do or not do in the future. So please weigh in really quickly, let me know. Did you like the breakout thing? Um, only about half of you have weighed in, so if you could quickly um, just vote yes or no. And I know it's like a more nuanced question than yes or no, but um, that's what we got, so. All right, uh, looks like most of you voted yes, few of you voted no, so okay. So we might try that again um, in the future. So let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about it. So, so you had a chance to talk with your peers, um, pros and cons of types. Go ahead and um, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, let me know what did you guys what did you guys come up with what what are some pros what are some cons of using types in programming Eric go ahead um, one of the pros that we talked about was that it's very easy to tell whether functions that you're trying to chain together match easily you can just look at the exit type to the enter type or return totally. type to the yeah yep totally. So you can know, so it makes writing programs a little bit easier, especially if you're dealing with an unfamiliar API or something like that. You're like, oh wow, it wants three arguments. Well, what is the, what, what's the type of the argument that helps us to write correct code? Okay, what else? I've got my whole, I've got a whole list. I'm sure that you guys have a few more ideas. Go ahead. Or go ahead, Eric. Yeah, if you want to. Um, another one that I just thought of is that you can put a little bit more information in because variables that you have just a name on, you can't always put everything that you want. I mean, you could have the most descriptive variable, whereas you could say we want a number and age. So you could kind of say positive or something. Okay, so yeah, so it, it tells you maybe a little bit more about what it what a function, for example, wants. Okay. Let me ask you this. What are some cons of types? What's a disadvantage? Go ahead, Jason. It makes your coding slower a lot of times. You have to you might have to like go up, go define a new type when you want to make something custom instead of being able to just like flexibly go together whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so so it's maybe harder to program, and you have to actually type all the types in. Ben, what do you think? I think earlier in the semester we defined a good language as one that maps really well to your own psyche and how your brain works. And generally types don't do that. They're a big stumbling block for a lot of people who are trying to learn programming in the beginning because they just don't understand types. Types make sense to a computer, but they don't really make sense to us all that much. Hmm. So you're saying the impedance match with a, with a, with a programmer's brain just isn't quite there, at least not in the beginning. Yeah, I think that may be true. So certainly languages like Python which, I mean, they have types, but languages like JavaScript and Python try really hard to not have the programmer think about types. And I think that's why it's so easy to program it. And as long as you sort of get the structural logic right, these languages do a lot of work under the hood, to try to make it like do what you intended it to do. Andy, what do you think? Um, you, you can kind of get around this with polymorphism, but that takes a lot of extra effort to design. But if you have some logic that should work the same way on a variety of different types of values, if you are using types, you need to duplicate that logic for each type of value you want. Whereas if you don't have types, you just create that logic once and pass it whatever you need. Right. So duct typing, um, I think, is what, what you're referring to. Um, and languages that support duct typing, they're fantastically general. Uh, but they have their own downsides. Okay, good. Um, sorry, Ben, did you have another comment? 
Your hand is still raised. Oh, now your hand is down. Okay. I just forgot to put my hand up. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Okay, so yeah, so um, so here were some thoughts. You know, here were some that I came up with. Um, so some pros um, and cons. So certainly with types, we can if we have a, a language with types and we've annotated our code properly, we can detect legitimate errors. Like sort of like what Eric was saying. We'll know if things that we're trying to fit together just don't fit together. We'll know that we're passing the correct arguments, at least the correct type of arguments, things like that. And that can reduce debugging time, which is good. One thing that types, um, like a strongly typed language, sorry, statically typed language can do is catch errors in code that you've never executed. So um, because the compiler will look at your code and they'll check all the types for you and make sure that everything matches up, even if you never run the code. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a, uh, a boon. Also, because the compiler has more information about what things are, it can generate more optimized code. And furthermore, the IDE can help out for the same reason. If the IDE knows what types things are supposed to be, the IDE can help you fill in, for example, the blanks of a function. Um, but as you've, as maybe you've pointed out, like types are a little annoying because there's this annotative overhead. Like, Nobody actually wants to write type annotations for their program. It just feels like busy work. And, and similarly, it can give you a false sense of security. So if you pass a type check, you might think that your code is correct. So you know, I, think there's, um, I think there's definitely some pros and cons to types and type systems. OK, so let's keep going here. So um, let's start talking now. We're going to compare. We're going to start introducing some terminology now and really start digging deep into what the different types, um, uh, sorry, different languages think about types. And as I said in the introduction, we're going to talk about these four different dimensions static versus dynamic, implicit versus explicit, strong versus weak, and nominal versus structural. Um, so let's start with static versus dynamic. This is the maybe the easiest dimension of comparison to think about. So in a statically typed language, uh, types are associated with variables, not values. And what I mean by that is if you declare a variable, say foo, um, you have to give it a type. And foo will always have that type. So the variable foo has a type. Whereas in other languages, um, so-called dynamically typed languages, think Python, for example, you have a variable, could be called foo, and it has a value. And that value is the thing with a type. But foo's value, foo's because the value associated with foo can change, the type associated with foo can also change. So static types are great for compiled languages. And um, the compiler can use all of the static type information and can go ahead and figure all sorts of stuff out and compile and generate all sorts of efficient code. Um, dynamic types, on the other hand, there's nothing you can do. You, you can only infer them at runtime. And so different languages, and this, so this is mostly dynamic types are really a thing for interpreted languages. But you can see some example, um, lots of the so-called easy languages. So things like JavaScript or um, Python or PHP, um, some of these sort of scripty feeling languages typically have dynamic types, whereas some of these, I don't know, I'll say harder core, <laughs> hardcore languages um, typically have static type systems. Okay, so static versus dynamic. So, um, so quick question. Let's see. Where is? Um, sorry, I'm going to uh, I rearrange my windows here. So let's talk about Racket. So where's Racket? What do you think? Static or dynamic? Go ahead. Let's say uh, static is yes, dynamic is no. So what's racket? Static yes, dynamic no. Racket, racket, racket. Static yes, dynamic no. Static yes, dynamic no. OK, got a lot of votes coming in. Um, Static yes, dynamic no. What is racket? All right, uh, looks like the votes are in. Looks like almost everybody voted no, so dynamic. Yeah, totally. So something like racket, at least the racket that we used. I mean, uh, a real PL person might know more about the depths of racket than what we plumbed. But, um, 
But to the extent that Racket is kind of like Lisp or Steam or something like that, uh, it definitely feels like it's a dynamically typed language. Right? So we, we have expressions, and we don't know the types of those expressions until runtime. Great. So let's, um, here's a couple of quick examples. So, so in a language like Python, whoops, you might have a function. And um, in a dynamically typed language, you, you know, you've got some function. And here, um, you've got an A thing. And we don't know what type A is. We're not even going to know. We don't know if we can even do this comparison until runtime. Hopefully, it'll work out. And then you've got something down here where we've got expressions. And those expressions, like this is an error. So in Python, you can't, you can't add five to the character three. Uh, but you can't catch that until you actually run this code. And you might not ever hit this code if A is always positive. So this is one of the disadvantages of dynamically typed languages, is that your compiler can't help you debug code that runs infrequently or never. By the way, this is a great argument for unit tests and code coverage and things like that. Um, Oh, yeah, let's keep going. We're a little behind. So, um, so but one, one very important note that I'd like to make sure that everyone is absolutely 100% clear in everyone's mind. So we've been talking about static versus dynamic type systems. But, but you need to distinguish static versus dynamic from whether or not you as a programmer are required to add type annotations. So for example, in Haskell, which, we're ta which we've been talking about the last couple of days, Haskell has an incredibly strong type system. And it is a static type system, which means that it's checked at compile time. But you don't have to write type annotations. So you can have a strongly statically typed language that doesn't have type annotations. And Haskell is the prime example of that. The reason you can do this is because Haskell has an incredibly powerful type inference engine. So it can infer all the types of all the expressions at compile time. Um, so we contrast that with another strongly, well, statically. So I was going to say C. C is actually weakly typed, but static, weakly, weak but static, but it's still static. C programs, on the other hand, you have static typing again. So the compiler knows the types of everything, but you as a programmer have to annotate it. So my point is only that whether or not a language has static typing is independent of whether or not you, the programmer, have to actually label everything with types. And that actually leads us to um, explicit versus implicit. So um, and in, an ex in a language with explicit types, you have to type out, you have to label everything. In a language with implicit types, um, types can be inferred. And I, I, yeah, this is, I should, instead of saying static strong, I think I should just say static type systems here. But plenty of good languages out there have um, type inference algorithms that let the compiler help out with types. Um, and the way that it works, I mean, you can kind of imagine how it must work. Here's a little example from, 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 Scala, uh, from Scala. So you can imagine defining a val. Uh, so I'm going to declare a variable, call it value, and immediately set it equal to quote ABC. Well, gosh, I don't have to label that as a string. I mean, I mean, what else could it be? Like we're def we're setting it equal to a string. Therefore, the type of this thing is string. Therefore, why would I have to annotate that as a program? And so languages um, with type inference let you sort of get around having to, the tedium of having to annotate things, but you still get the benefits of having a good type system. Similarly, here's another example. Like I declare some variable list, and it's a list of strings. Well, gosh, I know exactly what the type of this thing is. You don't have to tell me. That would just be redundant. Now, maybe the redundancy is a feature if you're using it as a safety net. But uh, as we sort of pointed out, eh, most of the time it feels like it gets in the way. Now, strongly versus weakly typed um, is a different dimension. So. In static versus dynamic typing, we've been talking about when um, uh, either a, lent, a compiler or an interpreter knows what things, what types every expression are. And in static languages, we know at compile time. In dynamic languages, we don't know until runtime. Um, 
But strong versus weak sort of um, tells us how strictly different types are distinguished and like, and like, are there loopholes in the type system? Um, so in a weakly typed language, the type system can be subverted. So you can all, I'm sure, think of languages where you can subvert the type system um, or where the type of the object can change depending on context. Andy, go ahead. What's meant by subverting the type system? Is that something like casting? Yes, yes, casting, oh my goodness. So casting is like the bane of every PL person's existence because casting, what that says is that says, here's this thing that we, we thought it was one type and I'm just gonna magically pretend it's a different type. And, and this is um, never a good idea. But like, I think that's roughly speaking what a, what a true PL pro person would tell you. Um, that, is a, that is a terrible idea. If you want to convert something to a different type, go ahead and explicitly convert it using a function with all the right type signatures, and then it will play nice with the entire system. But the fact that you can just magically declare, proof by fiat, that something is a different type anytime that you want, um, just means that the compiler has a heck of a time figuring out how to help you, and makes all sorts of bugs possible. Because like the burden is on the programmer now, like the language can't help you if you're just gonna magically type things however you want. Um, now, this is a little bit different than type conversion. So some languages let you convert types. They'll try to help you out in different s situations by converting things magically. And um, um, so uh, we'll see an example of that in just a second. So like, for example, C is a statically typed language. So we know what the types are at runtime, but it's weakly typed because we can cast things. Um, Python is dynamically typed, so we don't know the types of things until runtime, but it's strongly typed. There's no such thing as casting. Like values have types and they just have them. And, and also Python doesn't like do weird things under the hood to convert or promote types for you. PHP on the other hand is dynamic and weak because it'll do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and then Haskell is static and strong because at Haskell we know all of the types at runtime, sorry, compile time, and there's no possible way to subvert the type system. Um, so for example, if you try to write in Python, if you try to write foo equals x, so foo is a string, sorry, foo is a variable, it's bound to a value, that value has type string, and then we try to take that thing, that value of type string, and plus it with an integer, like Python was a geology, it's like, you can't do that. Whereas in PHP, like it's totally fine. And why is it totally fine? It's totally fine because PHP is doing all sorts of crazy stuff under the hood to make this work kind of in the way that you hoped it would work, but it's a lot of black magic. Um, so just to show you, I, I thought you might appreciate this. Um, so here's, here's um, you remember the Watt, the Watt video that we watched, Gary Bernhardt's talk, um, where he went through and <laughs> showed like all the problems with all of these uh, languages and their type systems. So remember this, you might remember this slide where he was talking about JavaScript. And he said, okay, remember like array plus array is empty string and array plus object is object. And because plus is commutative, we can just switch those and object plus array is clearly also object. Oh wait, no, it's not, it's zero. And object plus object is nan, right? Remember this? So, um, so the question is like, well, now that we've been talking about types, we have some language we can start putting to this. We can ask the question like, oh my goodness, like, what is like what's actually going on here? Why? like why these particular results and we don't have enough time to really like dive deep into all of them but let me just give you a flavor of the first one of like what's going on so list plus list equals string like why 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 would that be the case um by the way so just so just so, just so we're clear javascript is dynamic and weakly typed the reason it's dynamic is because um i mean it's just interpreted we, it's not you know, we don't know the types of anything until we actually run it. The reason it's weakly typed is because it does all sorts of weird type conversions and promotions for you. And it's those type conversions and promotions that are at the heart of this bizarre behavior and JavaScript. So, um, so this, um, so I did a little bit of research on this because I was curious, like what's going on. Here's the spec 
of what the addition operator in JavaScript is supposed to do. Okay, so the production additive expression plus multiplicative expression, I don't know why they call the right-hand side the multiplicative expression, but anyway, got the left-hand side and the right-hand side, is evaluated as follows. Get the, you know, so you evaluate the left-hand side, you evaluate the right-hand side, okay, like we would expect that. But then there's this weird like get value thing and to primitive thing, and then we check to see if they're strings. And if they're strings, then we go ahead and concatenate things. And it's like, whoa, like, hold on, like what? <laughs> like, so, so like in the spec of JavaScript is this crazy like type promotion and string manipulation stuff. And you can go and you can just start digging into this. So like, what is this two primitive function? Well, here's the result of the two primitive function. And it depends on the input type of the argument. And if it's if an object, so interestingly enough, a list, um, if you ask in JavaScript, what is the type of a list, it will say object. So the two primitive call will say, oh, two primitive on a list. Well, that's an object. So I've got to return some weird default value. Then there's this get value thing and or the, sorry, the two string thing, and like there's some rules in JavaScript for what two string does. And so you put this all together. Um, we've got these two array things, and we're trying to add them together. And so we end up calling two string on the arrays because they're objects, and the default representation of the object is nothing. And then so we get like this string on the left hand side and the string on the right hand side, and the result is just an empty string. It's like, what <laughs> like holy cow like that's a lot of complexity under the hood that we don't even know what's going on and this is why javascript um um this is why javascript has so many bugs of this sort because it things it tries really hard to make things work for you but at a cost at a cost of hiding um all sorts of logic and and as a result things might be working like we might think they're working but maybe they're not. So this actually, in my opinion, this hides bugs. Um, Grant, JavaScript is not the best language, but we will, um, maybe we can have that argument <laughs> some other time. All right, um, we've only have one minute left. Um, I actually think that's a great place to stop, although I'll just make this look, yeah, actually we'll talk about nominal versus structural on Monday. Grant, you really wanna die on this hill? Like, okay, we'll go to the map, man. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Remember conference challenge. We'll catch up on Monday, Sunday morning session, ridiculously hard questions. Take good notes and we'll see you then. Take care everybody, bye. Gotta figure out how to stop recording. Mm-hmm. Stop recording.